Hey, I'm Mel Strong, and this lecture is on monsoons. And we're going to start out talking about a couple of scenarios that will lead up to monsoons. And first, I want you to imagine that we've got an island sitting out in the ocean. And the ocean, let's say, is 70 degrees. Now, the ocean has a very high heat capacity, which means it takes a lot of energy to warm the ocean up. And then once the ocean is warm, it takes a long time for it to cool back down. And, and so, most places, the ocean temperature is pretty much the same day and night. It doesn't really change that much. So for this scenario, the ocean is 70 degrees. And it's going to be 70 degrees in the day and also at night. But the island has what we, a fairly low heat capacity, which means that its temperature is going to dramatically change from day to night. So this is the daytime. There's the sun. And the sun comes out and warms the island. And let's say it gets up to, 80 to uh, 85. Okay. So the temperature on the island is warmer than that of the surrounding water. And the air starts to rise. Okay. The air starts to rise. And if we think about what happened when we did this with uh, cumuliform clouds and convection, let's say maybe we get some sort of convective cloud above that, the air continues to rise, then exits the cloud, right? Okay, so for today, the important point is, if you're making air rise off this island, there has to be other air that comes and takes its place. So there has to be air moving in off the ocean to replace the air that's rising off the island. So if you're standing right here in this little picture, you would, you would feel the sea breeze, this wind coming in off the ocean. And so you've got wind coming in off the ocean. It rises. The air we exits the cloud. And if we could follow it around, we would have some kind of convection cell like this. Okay, so during the day, we have air moving in off the ocean, moving in land, then rising above the island. Okay, that's the day. Now let's say, same scenario, but it's the night. So now let's imagine what happens at night. So the sun has gone down, and we'll draw a... Here's the moon, let's say. And so the water is still 70. But our island, because it has a low heat capacity, you know, it warmed up quickly in the daytime. It's going to cool quickly at night. And let's say it cools down to 55. Okay. So now this colder than the surrounding ocean. So what would happen is you would have air that's rising on either side of the island and there is air that is replacing the rising air coming off of the island. So if you're standing here, you feel wind blowing out to sea. Okay, so this might rise and may or may not form a cumuliform cloud, but we set up a circulation pattern that's exactly the opposite of what we had in the daytime. So in, in the daytime, we had air rising because it was warmer than the air around it. At nighttime, we have air sinking over the island and air rising on either side of it. So this, the, the circulation exactly flipped, okay? So, let's extend this idea. Except now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the ocean and a continent. And now instead of thinking of day versus night, let's think about summer versus winter. Okay. So... If it is, let's say this is a 70 degree 
ocean. And we have a, con let's say it's the winter and the continent is, let's say, 50. Okay, and this is day and night, there'll be, there's going to be a 24 hour cycle of temperature. But let's think about a season here. During this entire winter season, the continent is going to be colder than the ocean. So what will happen is air will rise over the warmer ocean, right? And then this air over the continent is going to come out to replace the air that's rising. So again, if you're standing here, you've got you experience this breeze coming off the continent. So if we could trace this back, we would see that there's this this breeze coming down off the off the continent out into the ocean and then rising. Now, what is this air air like? Well, the way I've drawn this, we've got high elevations up here and we know that higher you go, the colder the air. So this is probably pretty dry and cold. And as that air comes down, the air warms. So sinking air warms. So this air coming down hill is warming, but it's not getting any more um, moisture. There's no source of moisture. So the only thing that's changing as this comes down is the relative humidity is decreasing, so you're making the air warmer, but the dew point mixing ratio is staying the same. So when you come down here, you've got low relative humidity, dry air. Okay, and when I say warm, that's relatively speaking, right? This could be this could all be really cold air. Of course, we said it's 50 degrees. That's not that cold, but whatever temperature this is, this might be air that's way below freezing and it's coming down the continent, and as it comes down, it warms. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean it feels warm to you. It's just getting warmer. But the point is, we've got cold, dry air coming down the continent, going out to sea. Okay, so this is analogous to what happens in a place like India. Okay, so, so my continent here is maybe India. And this part up here are the Himalayan mountains. So the Himalayan mountains, that's that big mountain chain between India and the Tibetan plateau. So think of like Mount Everest, right? You've got Mount Everest is one mountain in this big chain of really tall mountains. You've got a really, you've got really tall mountains up here uh, on the way to uh, Pakistan over here in the Tibetan plateau. So this then is the Indian Ocean And this is what India experiences throughout the winter. Very, very dry conditions. They've got air sinking down off the Himalayans, coming down across the continent, out into the ocean where it then meets relatively warm water and rises. All right, so let's now think about, so remember, just to make sure it's clear, this is the winter. Okay, this is the winter. So we're gonna do the same scenario in the summer. Okay, so now I'm going to draw another one just like this one. And we'll say for the sake of argument that the ocean is still 70 degrees. But now it is the summer. And the continent warms up more than the ocean. So again, there's a, there's a day-night cycle. But overall, the continent is staying warmer than the ocean. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that it's 80 over here. Okay. So now we've got air that's rising above the continent, and that is going to pull in air from the ocean. Now, what's the air like that's over the ocean? Well, this is a pretty warm ocean. So this is high dew point air, right? So back when we talked about evaporation, you got warm body water, you got a lot of evaporation. This is very humid air, and now you're, you're pulling it over the continent, where the continent is warmer than the ocean. 
So you're going to have rising plumes of air that lead to thunderstorms. And you're going to have them all up and down. I'm just drawing this, them in one spot, but you're going to have this more and more as you go up the continent. So in fact, you get all the way up here. Remember, this is the Himalayan mountains up here, Mount Everest, all that good stuff. And as air rises up over those mountains, they're going to make some really extremely uh, convective thunderstorms up here, right? So as air rises, say above the Himalayan mountains, that's going to help pull this warm, humid air up over the continent. So, and it, just to be clear, you'd have rising air on all these. I'm just trying to point out that you've got this big scale circulation pattern, which is that air is being sucked in off the ocean, rising up over the Himalayan mountains, and rising up in other places too, but the circulation has reversed. So if you're standing here in the scenario, the wind has come, is 180 degrees the other direction. In the winter, it was moving out towards the ocean. In the summer, it's moving in from the ocean. That's a monsoon. Okay, so the monsoon circulation monsoon circulation simply means we had a seasonal shift in the wind. Now, because there's an ocean out here and it's pretty warm, that seasonal shift in the wind means we have a dry season and then a wet season. Okay, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, the very definition of a monsoon is that it's just simply a seasonal reversal in wind direction. So it blows one way part of the year and then it blows from another way another part of the year. It could and usually does lead to a wet season and dry season. Now, if you're from New Mexico, we talk about the monsoon as the wet time in the summer. And we'll talk about that in a second. But truly, the definition of the monsoon just means the wind has reversed direction. And it doesn't mean it's reversed for a day or even a week. It's a seasonal thing, right? So it completely re reverses for months, usually. That's, a, that's what a true monsoon is. So here's an example of what India looks like before monsoon and after a monsoon. So here's two pictures taken from the same location. You can see they stitched them together. And you can see the, the huge difference in vegetation between the dry period and the wet period. A lot of what we know about modern weather was first figured out when people were trying to understand when and why the monsoon in India happens. So, because it's so dry for so long, uh, farmers would like to know exactly when they should plant their crops to take advantage of when the, all this rain starts. So, 100 years or so ago, people were really interested in trying to figure out the timing of the monsoon. And a lot of the things that we've been talking about so far, like air pressure and all that stuff, was studied intensely to try to figure out how to time the monsoon. Turns out, even today, you can't really predict it very well. So it's, it's not something that the actual reversal often just occurs on one day, where just suddenly the whole circulation shifts. And it turns out it's not, even today, we still can't completely predict that. So I'm going to return to an animation we saw last time. And so we were talking in the last lecture about how uh, this ITCZ uh, corresponds to the, to the warmest place on Earth. So here we are in the first of the year. There's India right there. There's the Himalayan Mountains right there. And we have the ITCZ here. So I'm going to move this further. So in how we're, in, we're in February, right? So just to remind you, what's happening along the ITCZ? You got easterlies coming in in the northern hemisphere. You got easterlies coming in from the southern hemisphere. They are colliding, right? It's intertropical convergence zone. So there's that convergence. So right here, you can imagine the winds are coming down off of uh, Southeast Asia, off of India, 
coming from the northwest moving towards that equator right so i mean so, uh, towards the itcz so we get into spring and notice what's happening the itcz is creeping towards india and southeast asia and then notice right there we're actually coming in over india so from their perspective they went from a time where the ITCZ was pretty far away to the ITCZ is actually on top of them. And then throughout their, their summer, it kind of lingers over the continent and then fall, it leaves again. Okay. So here's a, a couple graphical illustrations of that. So during the winter, the ITCZ is down here. And if you lived in northern Australia, you have a wet season right now because the ITCZ is right above you. But if you're in India, they have winds coming mostly out of the north, down from the Himalayan mountains, and it's super dry. By the time summer rolls around, the ITCZ is up above India. You've got wind coming up from the south, a lot of precipitation. But now it's left Australia and they're getting wind coming from the south, coming from the middle of their continent, which is very dry. So these two locations have swapped their wet and dry seasons. Now you can see this if you were to make uh, histograms, bar graphs of precipitation. So in India, so each one of these is a month, January, February, March, April, etc. And then this is how many millimeters of precipitation they get each month. So we're looking at uh, this, this one location in India, uh, dry, 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 and then all of a sudden in June, you see that, bam, huge increase of precipitation. That's the arrival of this ITCZ, the arrival of, quote unquote, the monsoon. And then it tapers down and then disappears by the end of the year. Australia, the northern part of Australia is exactly the opposite. You can see this is their wet season, and then it disappears. They have a super dry summer, and it's their winter because seasons are reversed. And then uh, it gets wet again at the end of the year. Okay, so these two are basically opposites of each other, and that's because of this moving ITCZ. Just a reminder, why is the ITCZ moving? Because the seasons are changing. So we're heating the northern hemisphere, then we're heating the southern hemisphere, and the ITCZ is following the warmest part of the ocean uh, up and down, north and south. So this animation shows how the winds uh, reverse in this part of the world. And what we're looking at is about 15 years of wind and precipitation data, all averaged out. So each one of these little arrows shows you the direction of the wind. The longer the arrow, the faster the wind right? That's what, how they're doing. And then you see the precipitation are, are these colors. So if you think, okay, I'm going to stand right out here in India. There's the winter. You can see the wind coming down off the continent and it's dry. And then boom, there's the monsoon. The winds reverse, wet. And it returns back to dry again. And you can see that band of rain comes down and visits northern Australia and then leaves it. So these two locations that we just showed in the previous slide uh, are having, you know, reversed seasons. So when one's wet, the other one's dry. When the other one's dry, the other one's wet, etc. So we're going to look at a, a little video here that's on YouTube that was put together by some NASA uh, scientists. And what they've done here is they've been studying the monsoon using a lot of satellite data. And I'm mostly just going to let it play. I'm going to interrupt it now and then. Uh, just to make obnoxious uh, comments. So let's start this. The monsoon is a seasonal rain and wind pattern that was first described over South Asia. You see the clouds blossoming here during the summer part of the monsoon. For centuries, people have known about it, but only recently have we received enough data from satellites to really describe what's going on. Okay, so the first thing is notice that down here, there is uh, the date, uh, so June 14th, 2014, and then the time. So what we're going to be looking at is, I mean, images are being updated every few minutes, and so you'll see the time whizzing by here 
uh, day after day after day. Also, just make sure we're clear, this is all Doppler radar, so this is all precipitation that they're showing in the colors. What you can see here is moist air that has evaporated from the ocean coming across India and providing rainfall driving the monsoon season. The great thing about GPM is that it allows us to see precipitating systems as a whole over land and oceans and then as they transition from one boundary to the next. All of this rainfall drives soil moisture over land. It's beneficial because it promotes the economic activity that people depend on, for example, agriculture. Okay, so just in case you didn't catch it, this is the soil moisture color scheme over here. So they're looking at uh, how the soil moisture is changing uh, throughout the raisin, uh, rainy season. As well, it fills the rivers, which provides water for human activity and the natural environment, as well as transportation. If the rivers get too full, of course, it becomes flooding. At first, the floods you see here are fairly minor and broad scale, but then they concentrate in the few wiggly lines, which are the river basins, for example, in central eastern China. In mountainous regions, when the ground becomes saturated due to heavy rains, it can lead to landslides. Landslides kill thousands of people every year and are primarily triggered by rainfall. They are especially common within the Himalayan region each monsoon season. One really cool way to look at the monsoon is to do a split screen and look at the summer and the winter at the same time. In the summer, the wind is blowing onshore, bringing the moist, rain-laden air into the continent. In the wintertime, it blows off the continent. Now those winds are basically driven by temperature differences between the ocean and the land. And where the land is nice and warm, the air expands and it draws in the moist precipitation from the ocean waters. But in the wintertime, it's very cold and you can see that the moisture then it goes from the continent back into the oceans. Okay, so this is what we talked about earlier with the, the how the wind has shift direction. What they're showing here our, uh, this is temperature. So you'll see that as it, as it moves from day, night, day, night, day, night, you can see the, temp, the continent getting warmer and then cooler, warmer than cooler. And it does it also in the winter. The difference is, on average, the continent is still warmer than the ocean. And over here, the, on average, the continent is colder than the ocean. So if you watch these two, you can see how, yes, the continent gets warmer in the day and cools off at night. But the difference between the two is how it compares to the ocean. So that's what those uh, fluctuating colors mean. Over the past 50 years or so, satellites have been used to measure precipitation all around our Earth. With that data set, we're able to understand that monsoons occur not only in South Asia and India, but in other parts of the world as well. For example, Africa, where the temperature gradient is between the Atlantic Ocean and the Sahara Desert. The wind blows from the moist Atlantic Ocean onto West Africa, providing the moisture for the precipitation. Some of these westward moving storms provoke hurricanes over the Atlantic that occasionally make it to the U.S. Southwestern North America also has a summertime monsoon. You see high soil moisture in regions where there's a lot of precipitation in western Mexico. And later in the season, this extends up into the southwestern U.S. And the southern hemisphere has a monsoon as well. This occurs in the northern hemisphere winter, which is a southern hemisphere summer, when Australia is warmer than the ocean to the north. Having a better understanding of the global water cycle and monitoring changes over time is important for society, for our everyday lives and our long-term future. So near the end of that video, they talked about the monsoon in the southwestern part of the United States. And of course, that's what we refer to as the monsoon. And as far as monsoons go, ours is really pretty wimpy. And monsoon purists would say that, in fact, it hardly counts as a monsoon uh, compared to ones like India and Africa. Uh, but for us, it's important because it represents half of our annual rainfall. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, back when we talked about um, humidity and dew point, we were talking about how the dew point in New Mexico changes 
uh, a lot depending on the wind direction. So if you have wind coming out of the west or the, uh, the north, you, we typically have very low dew points because the air is coming from a pretty cold source. Whereas if we have um, winds coming from the, the east or the south or the southeast, we typically have relatively high dew points because it's come somewhere from a pretty warm ocean source. So the big picture about the New Mexican monsoon is that through most of the year, our winds are like this. They're coming out of the west. They are, we are in the westerlies. And then for July, August, a little bit of September, we get a couple months where the winds very weakly kind of reverse and we get a weak easterly or southeasterly or maybe even a, a southerly flow. And that's what triggers our summertime uh, thunderstorms that we call the monsoon. So to explain why this happens, I'm going to go over a uh, a new concept that's a, that's kind of abstract, um, but we, we kind of have to cover it to, to understand the next uh, maps we're going to see. Let's imagine that we've got the, we're going to cut a cross section of the atmosphere that, that those are supposed to be trees, and I have a blob of cold air, and cold air is pretty dense, and right next to it I've got a blob of warm air, and warm air, uh, if you warm up air, it expands. So my blob of warm air is more expanded. And let's imagine that um, I was going to get into a balloon. Let's, first of all, let's just think about this is, even though I've got a ground and trees, let's imagine we're at sea level down here. What's the air pressure at sea level? It's about 1,013 millibars. Okay, so back when we talked about air pressure. Let's imagine I get into a balloon and I got my barometer and I go up and I'm trying to find how high I have to go to get to 700 millibars, okay? And so let's say I find that spot and it turns out it's about right here. Okay, so go up in a balloon, find the 700 millibar level and plot it on a map and I take many balloon rides to find this and when I get to the warm air, what I would find is because the cold air is more dense and compacted, I get to the 700 millibar level sooner than if I was in a balloon and went into the warm air. I had to go farther up to get to that 700 millibar level. So it might be something like this. And we call this height, in this case to the 700 millibar, level. We call this the geopotential height. Now that's a fancier term than we need in this class. We can just imagine how high do you have to go to get to a certain pressure level. I could make one for a 500 millibars. I'd have to go higher up. I could make it for whatever level I wanted. But in this case I'm going up to 700 millibars. The point is that if I were to do this experiment in a balloon I would have to go further up to get to the 700 millibar level because that air is more expanded because it's warmer. So we're going to see this on a map in a second. We would call this area up here a high and this area down here a low. So like we talked about air pressure, you had highs and lows. It's similar to that, but it's talking about a different thing. The surface is high the geopotential height surface is what we call this as high, and the height surface is low. Okay, so we got to do this because I want to, we're not going too deep here. I just want to explain this to, so that the next map will make sense. So we're going to look at some maps of this, what we call the 700 millibar surface. And I put these maps on Learn, they're also on my website. And what they've done here is, for example, this first one, February 1st to February 28th. So that's looking at every day in the month of February for the last 30 years, averaging where that 700 millibar height level is and plotting as contours. So here, for example, 3140. Okay, so what does that mean? So this map and all the ones we're going to look at are 700 millibar height. 
How far up do you have to go above sea level to get to 700 millibars? It doesn't tell you this, but the units are in meters. So I'd have to go up 3,140 meters to get to 700 millibars. And if I stayed on this line, that's exactly going to be 700 millibars. Uh, over here, the height would be 3,130 meters, 20, 10. So you can see that the height is going down as, these, as we move to the north. Why is that? Because the air up here is pretty cold, so it's compressed. Air down here is pretty warm, so it's expanded. So we can put in some highs and lows here, just like a pressure map. So at the top here, the numbers are smaller, smaller, smaller. There's a low, I'm going to put right there. And then here, I've got a high right here. Okay, so this low is due to the fact that the air up there is just really cold and compressed. This high, this kind of loop here, is due to one of the subtropical highs. And this one is called the Bermuda High, which I'm just going to write down here, the Bermuda High. And this high pressure system will, uh, as we see, will, will change just like the, there's one over here, the Pacific Subtropical High, which isn't really shown so much on this map here. Okay, the rules for which direction winds go are the same as they were for air pressure. Clockwise around a high, counterclockwise around a low in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so here's the high. So I've got clockwise around this high, parallel to the contours. So my wind is like this. And then over here, it's still in that same general trend in that it's a clockwise sensation around the high, counterclockwise sense around the, the low. And if I were to just kind of draw some of these in, what I see is basically the winds are going parallel to the contours and time and time again in this part of the country that gets you air that's coming kind of down from the west northwest direction right so in New Mexico we just think about New Mexico we got wind coming straight out of the west here okay and we've got westerlies in fact the whole country is in westerlies at this point and only down here do we see anything that's kind of easterlies, way down in here. Okay, so we can move on to um, March, and it's pretty much exactly the same. Uh, the whole country is still in the westerlies, so I will draw a few arrows here to illustrate, but our winds are still coming out of the west, so they're cold and they're dry. Okay, so now we're moving on to um, April here, and we can see that we have a high down here. That's our Bermuda high. We still have a low up in here. And we still have, there's really nothing much has changed too much yet. We still have counterclockwise around the high. And everybody is still pretty much in the westerlies, including us. Okay, so we, are st we still have wind coming out of the west. All right, we get to May. Okay, so same kind of thing. We don't really see it down here, but the, uh, our Bermuda High is kind of lingering down here. Um, and again, for us, New Mexico, still nothing much has changed except we're starting to see this little dip down here. Okay, so our winds are coming out of the west, but they're actually starting to come sort of across this, um, the northern part of the Gulf of California, right here. And it's possible that we might be picking up some moisture here. But if we go further back, it's still coming off the cold Pacific Ocean. Okay. So, so far, nothing much has changed yet. We're still in the westerlies. And now I'm going to break it up. So the maps we've been seeing so far are once a month. I'm going to break it down into one every two weeks now. So this is the first half of June. 
Okay, here's our Bermuda high. It's getting stronger. Why is it getting stronger? Same reason the Pacific subtropical high gets stronger in the summer. We're heating the northern part of the hemisphere and it's getting stronger and it's growing. So here it is. Here's the high. And we, our low is off the page here somewhere. Clockwise around the high. Okay, so I'm going to go around this way. Parallel to the contours. Okay, so notice that if I were to kind of draw this out, Southeast Texas is starting to, to change its wind direction, right? They're moving out of the westerlies. We are still coming out of the west, but we still have this little dip here. We're, but we're potentially getting some moisture from Gulf of California here, all right? But the rest of the country is still pretty much in the westerlies. Okay, let's go to the last half of June. Now, our Bermuda high is now uh, stronger, and so we can see the influence of that. Here's kind of clock, or I'm sorry, clockwise ro uh, rotation, clockwise, clockwise. We have a funny little nose here, but it's still clockwise. Okay, notice what's happening. So at the end of June, if we follow our air trajectory back in time, it's possible that some of it could have come from uh, the Gulf of Mexico, except I had to travel all the way across Mexico and then come around this way. Northern Mexico is still getting it out of the Pacific. But we're starting to see a transition to air that's coming from a different place. Well, if, if it had to come all the way across Mexico, it probably lost most of its moisture uh, on the way here. So it's still not really humid air for the most part. Uh, and if you, if you know anything about the monsoon, you know that in general it starts uh, usually about the first week of July. And we're getting really close, right? We're near the end of June. Okay, so now we're going to move on to beginning of July. Okay, so now here's our high. And we've got clockwise rotation around the high. And notice what we've got here. We've now transitioned so that the wind that's coming into New Mexico, if we trace it back, has its origins in the Gulf of Mexico. And unlike we saw in the previous one, it doesn't have to go all the way out to, to the Pacific and loop back. Some of it looks like it has a direct route across, New, uh, across Mexico and right into uh, New Mexico and that is the trigger of our monsoon so we are now out of the westerlies and we're starting to get flow that's maybe southerly flow maybe a little bit of a southeast component remember these are averaged over 30 years so the wind can change day to day a little bit this is what happens when you average over you know a two-week period for 30 years okay so then we get to the end of July and here's our Bermuda high. So you notice that the Bermuda high over time has been migrating to the north. Uh, so that's what the Pacific subtropical high, it's migrating to the north. It's out, it's out here somewhere, uh, not on our map really. But that's what's causing this, this shift. So again, we can draw clockwise around the high and it's pretty clear from this now that any wind that's coming this direction has its origins from the Gulf of Mexico, right? So you've got circulation coming around, entering New Mexico, straight from the Gulf of Mexico. So we've got high dew points now. Monsoon is in full swing, usually. Okay. So in, um, in August, it's pretty much more of the same story. Here's our high. Here's our rotation around that high. Now, one thing that I want you to notice that's different here if I go back to 
say, June. Do you see how close the contours are to each other? Remember when we talked about wind and we said that the wind direct, the wind speed um, is proportional to the, your pressure gradient. So the closer these are together, uh, the faster the wind goes. That was with pressure gradient. It's the same thing with this height gradient. So if I go to where we are now, notice we see almost and there's no contours across the, the entire state at all. There's a very low height gradient. Also, we could say there's a very low pressure gradient, which means that the winds themselves are very, very weak. Okay, so even though I'm drawing it in these loops like this, it's a very weak wind. Okay, it's a very, very weak wind, which is one of the things that makes purists say this isn't really a, a very proper monsoon. Uh, the winds just kind of die in the in the moisture kind of trickles upwards towards us but anyway uh let's keep going so that's beginning of august and now we're getting to the end of august and what's happening now is our high pressure uh, the bermuda high starting to make its way back to the south okay and our pacific subtropical high which is out here in the ocean is also starting to make its way back but we're getting that clockwise rotation and so we are still if I kind of draw in some arrows here we're still uh, getting moisture out of the Gulf of uh, Mexico for the most part here then we get to so beginning of September and we're still in it now our monsoon on average typically dies out about the middle of September okay so here we were in the beginning of September here we're in the last half of September and so here we've got our high and it's kind of a weird shaped high but we're getting this and this. Okay, so notice what happened. The northern part of New Mexico is now, if you follow it around, is coming out of the Pacific Ocean. Maybe the southeast part of New Mexico is still getting some from Gulf of Mexico, but it's still having to travel quite a ways to get there. That's different than just a couple weeks before when we had wind coming across uh, pretty much straight from the Gulf of Mexico here. So, by the when you start making the transition back to moisture from the Pacific, monsoon is over. Okay, and so somewhere about halfway through September, uh, we stop getting those daily thunderstorms. So I'm gonna say the monsoon is over. Okay, and now when we move on. To October so that Bermuda high is now centered again it's it's marching its way south and it's getting weaker so we have this this and now we're pretty much back into the westerlies okay so in October we're back in the westerlies and then it just goes back to kind of where we started so here we are late October and we are right back where we were before the monsoon. So, why do we have a monsoon? We have a monsoon because this shifting subtropical high migrates north and south with the seasons, and it changes the circulation pattern around it. So, when it gets to about beginning of July, this is situated far enough north that we start to get into a little bit of an easterly, southeasterly flow, and we're out of the westerlies, finally. And then that allows some cumulonimbus to occur, and then a couple months after that, it starts migrating its way back down, and we go back into the westerlies, and we're back to dry air. So back when we talked about dew point, we looked at a, one of these graphs, and this is dew point 
in Albuquerque at the airport during the monsoon season. So there's a blue line and a red line. Uh, the blue line is the dew point as recorded in 2013. The red line is the average of the dew point in the previous 30 years. Okay, so let's just look at the red line first. The red line, again, averaged for 30 years. And what we see, so, so dew point is on the, the y-axis, so 30 degrees, that would be in Fahrenheit. And so in June, we're typically in the westerlies. And so we have pretty low dew points. And on average, it ramps up and ramps up until uh, we get to this 47 degree line, this green line right here. And the weather service here has kind of picked that line. It's kind of arbitrary, but the idea is that if we have three days of dew points above 47 degrees, three consecutive days, then we're going to call that the beginning of the monsoon. And if you average the last 30 years, that comes out to be, this line right here is July 11th. So right around July 10th or 11th or so is about three days beyond where that red line crosses the green line. So you'll read about the average date, the average start of the New Mexican monsoon is uh, about July 10th or 11th. That's where it comes from, just averaging 30 years of dew point. And then usually our dew point stays above that uh, 47 degree line and then it dips back down. So this is uh, September 9th, right around there. And then it continues to go downhill uh, as we go back into the westerlies. Okay, so that's average, right? Averaged over 30 years. It gives you kind of a smooth uh, red line. Now, the blue line is what happens in an actual year. In this case, this is 2013. And so you see a lot of wiggles up and down that correlate to wind direction. So when it's high, that means we had wind coming out of the east higher dew points. When it's low, that's dew, uh, wind coming out of the west or north, that's low dew points. And so you can see that leading up to the actual monsoon, the winds are changing direction, right? So we've got easterlies, westerlies, easterlies, westerlies. And then finally, it kind of gets into the easterlies and stays there for a while. Within the monsoon, there are little variations where the winds shift back and forth a little bit. But we hit but at least in 2013, we, you know, for the most part, we stayed above that green line throughout most of the monsoon season. So throughout most of the summer, our dew point was hovering, you know, over 50 degrees or so. You see a couple places where it dipped down a little bit, and so we call those monsoon breaks. Usually, they're corresponded with uh, times when we have either a high pressure center or the winds come out of the west or the north and we have a lack of cumulonimbus and our dew points go down. And then on this particular year, it kind of had a crazy end. Looks like we had a lot of uh, unusually humid air uh, in middle September and finally it dies, you know, somewhere here near, uh, you know, last half of September. Well, every year is different. So here's 2014. We see we had a couple really uh, pretty significant monsoon breaks. Everywhere you see this, Refer to this as a monsoon burst, which means that we have air with extra water vapor in it, and often that leads to um, uh, more cumulonimbus. Um, if we go to see 2015, here's an interesting one. Here's 2016. Um, so we had what's called an er, uh, early start to the monsoon. So three days after the green line, there's one, two, three monsoon starts and it's before it's before july so if you look at the newspaper headlines back then everybody's super excited that the monsoon has started early and so we have several days of monsoon activity and then it crashes and we see that the dew point went way down super dry air right dew points are like 15 degrees that's that's like middle of the winter air and it stayed low and didn't rebound back to normal until, uh, this is what, July 21st before we're back to uh, kind of average. So we had a really, basically we had a completely dry month that it rained right in the end of June, very beginning of July, and then the rest of the July was pretty much dry uh, before we bounced back to normal. Every monsoon season is different. It has a unique 
uh, monsoon break or a monsoon burst pattern. And it's only by averaging every year over and over and over do you get that kind of smooth red line that shows you what the average dew point was. So if we made pre uh, precipitation histograms, kind of like the ones that we saw from India and Australia, this is what it looks like. So the way you read these is this first bar is January, and then it goes through the year, and the last bar is December. So notice, say along the west coast here in Mexico and California, you've got wet, relatively wet, winters, dry summers. Okay, So in Merced, wet winter, dry summer. That's what we call Mediterranean climate. We talked about this last time. That Pacific subtropical high forms out here. It makes it really dry along the coast in the summer. And then the, the uh, mid-latitude cyclones come through and make it wet in the, in the winter. We see the rain shadow effects over here in Nevada. It's pretty much dry all year round, so in Las Vegas. But notice what happens when you get over here. You see a completely different pattern. So here in Hermosillo, it's super, super dry, super, super dry. And then about June, July, bam, we get a big increase in precipitation and then it tapers off, or this one, or this one, okay? Those are classic monsoon patterns. So here in the States, we've got Tucson, um, very, very dry, 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 dry. The driest month in there is June, and then bam, the wettest month is July, the month after. That's where that monsoon circulation starts. So we go from the westerlies to the easterlies or the southeasterlies, and suddenly Tucson gets their monsoon uh, start. So monsoon uh, precipitation can be noticed on these uh, histograms with this kind of pattern where it gets super dry and all of a sudden a spike where, a sudden, where the circulation suddenly shifted. In fact, there's this dotted line right here that says 50%. So this right through in here, that means the area within here gets 50% of their annual precipitation during the monsoon. And so what we think of as our monsoon is really a Mexican phenomenon. And in fact, decades ago, it was referred to in scientific literature as the Mexican monsoon. And later, uh, people from the U.S. renamed it. They called it the North American monsoon. So we kind of stole it from the Mexicans. But what do you know? So these contours uh, show how much of your annual precipitation comes during the summer. So this number, your 60% of your annual precipitation falls in the summer, 55%, 50, 45. So notice that out of all the states in the Union, we have the biggest blob of monsoonal precipitation, meaning that for New Mexico, roughly half of our precipitation falls in the summer due to this monsoonal circulation. But for the most part, it's actually a Mexican phenomenon. We just get just the dregs of it up into New Mexico. Arizona gets a little bit too.